What is socialism and why does it fail? Part 2. Socialism in Practice Now that I have covered the theory of socialism in my latest video, what is socialism and why does it fail? Part 1. The Theory of Socialism I will now explain how socialism works in practice. To review the basics, socialism is the public ownership of the means of production, meaning that the state controls the economy. The state sets prices, wages, and determines how much of a product will be produced, or if it will be produced at all. Among, along with all the other elements of an economy, such as retail trade and the creation of capital goods, such as factories, machinery, tools, and others. This, com this is compared to a market economy in which all elements of an economy are determined by market forces, such as supply and demand, and the incentive of individuals. I will explain more about the state's role in the economy later, but the thing to always remember about government ownership of the economy is that it cannot plan an economy, and thus it can produce the same results as a free market, not even close. The first example of a truly socialist country was the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, or RSFSR, which later became the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the USSR, which included multiple republics including Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, and various others. While there have been examples of temporary period of socialist rule over a given territory, such as the Paris Commune, it was very unstable and didn't last that long. Following the chaos of the First World War and the failures of the Russian Republic to end the war and provide people with their basic necessities, the Bolsheviks, led by Lenin, staged a revolution in Russia after promising the people Mir, Zimla, i Chlieb, or in English, Peace, land, and bread. Lenin established the All Russian Central Executive Committee of the Soviets, which was led by the people, by the Council of the People's Commissars. The Council of the People's Commissars was the body with the highest authority over the Central Executive Co Committee, and this included powerful people such as Vladimir Lenin, the chairman, Joseph Stalin, the People's Commissioner of Nationalities, and Leon Trotsky, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, among many others. The brutal Russian civil war was raging and the Soviets began to implement socialist policies such as the nationalization of all industries, state control of trade, and confiscation and redistribution of grain and other, and other grown food, and the ban on private enterprise and production. Due to a policy of war communism, especially the confiscation of grain from farmers at fixed prices to evenly redistribute amongst, among the remaining population, this led to the underproduction of grain and eventually a famine. The Russian famine of 1921 to 1922 killed approximately 5 million people, and some people even had to resort to cannibalism to survive. The horrific policy of war communism ended in 1921, and the new economic policy, or NAP, began. The new economic policy would allow for private production, enterprise, trade, the free market, and capitalism, albeit state regulated and controlled. Socialized state enterprises would also operate on a profit basis, meaning that there will be act there will be an actual incentive for running the state enterprise. The NAP possibly saved millions of lives, and without it, the RSFSR and the USSR would have likely collapsed, since the economy of the country had severely suffered and declined since 1915. The USSR was officially created on December. On, tw on the 28th of December 1922, in which the delegations from the Russian SFSR, Transcaucasian SFSR, the Ukrainian SSR, and the Belarusian SSR approved the, crea approved the treaty on the creation of the USSR. Vladimir Lenin's testament was handed over to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, calling for the restructuring of the Soviet governing system and the criticism of members such as Joseph Stalin and Leon Trotsky. Lenin died on the 21st of January, 1924, by having a stroke and then proceeding to fall into a coma. Stalin, after the death of Lenin, took charge of the funeral when it was pe and was one of its pallbearers. Lenin's corpse was placed in a mausoleum in the Red Square of Moscow. Stalin was devoted to Leninism and created a personality cult around Lenin renaming Petrograd to Leningrad and writing a series of books known as the Foundations of Leninism. Stalin, due to his support of the NAP, was called a writer by the left-wing opposition group which was created by Trotsky. The left opposition believed that the new economic policy had betrayed the ideas of communism and had conceded too much to capitalism. 
Gradually, the left opposition became less and less of a threat as Stalin gained more and more power. After Stalin became the supreme leader of the Communist Party, he entrusted his allies to run the Politburo and other state-run institutions. Stalin then cleared all dissent, mostly using force and creating a government institution known as the Gulag, which managed the forced labor camps set up by the Order of Vladimir Lenin. Anyone who was against Stalin's change, which included the party members, was sent to forced labor camps. Eventually, millions of people passed through the Gulag systems and hundreds of thousands died due to extreme conditions and being massively overworked in the labor camp. Stalin ruled the USSR with an iron fist. Only he and his supporters were in control, and the only, and the only acceptable view was to be a supporter of Stalin. Stalin initiated his five-year plan, which planned to rapidly industrialize the Soviet Union with central planning and collective agricultural production. The collectivization of agriculture banned private farming, and thus reduced total grain production by 32%. While there were many more people in industries who, which relied on stable food production, so the procurement or purchasing of grain increased by 44%. This is very disruptive for agricultural supply and demand as the demand for grain vastly exceeded the supply, which led to a famine in many places across the USSR. The group with the largest grain production and most complex private farming system were the Ukrainians. And this was totally shut down by Stalin, making all agricultural activities collective, and everything that was produced previously under the private system would be confiscated by the Communist Party. This reduced the incentive for growing food as well as reducing the efficiency, and far less grain was produced in Ukraine that year. Meanwhile, the demand and purchase of grain was up, and enough grain simply wasn't produced to accommodate for this demand. This led to the Holodomor, also known as the Terror Famine, in which millions of Ukrainians starved to death. The Holodomor is considered an act of genocide by 16 countries, and a, trage and a tragedy or a crime against humanity by five international organizations. However, despite the famines and millions of deaths, the Salon actually managed to industrialize the Soviet Union. The answer to the question is... sort of. Stalin did manage to industrialize the USSR. The USSR produced more capital goods such as factories, tools, and machinery, and the amount of industrial consumer goods increased, as well as more people were working for industry. However, this only happened because of the terror enforced through Stalin's rule. If you didn't work and comply, it would either be Gulag or the firing squad. In addition, workers had terrible working conditions with very low wages. One fact that is often not talked about about Stalin's five-year plan is that it needed the aid of foreign companies, mostly American, to build factories and machinery. The USSR paid foreign companies to build factories and machinery with the money generated by selling grain to foreign countries. The grain came from the private farms that were robbed by the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. To conclude my analysis of Stalin's five-year plan, it worked to an extent, but only with terror, famines, and oppression. If the people of a market economy had an incentive to start a wide-scale voluntary industrialization with no force required, it would be far more efficient, resulted in greater industrialization in a shorter period of time, and have no mass famines or terror killings. This is proven by the fact that Stalin's USSR hired foreign private companies because they were more efficient at building factories and machinery than the state workers. The state workers were forced to do something they didn't like, weren't good at, and, and where there was little incentive for them to work since they could receive the same wage as someone who worked hard by doing the absolute bare minimum. Most of the workers only did the bare minimum required at their job as they were not rewarded if they worked harder as they did not get paid more to compensate for, for working harder. To save time, I will skip the economic policies of the Soviet Union during World War II, as it was basically just war communism version 2.0. After the death of Stalin in, 1950, in 1953, Nikita Khrushchev became the general secretary of the Communist Party and started a process of reforms known as de-Stalinization. Khrushchev was a reformist and wanted to better compete with the United States of America in the fields of space, technology, and science, and military. The USSR spent a huge amount of its money on developing ways to enter sp space, technology, and the military, and the only reason for this was not to benefit the people, but was to show the United States that they were better, that the USSR was better than them. The Soviet people lived with only their basic needs, and a horrible state-provided apartment that you possibly have to wait years for, and due to the broken feedback loop, Sons and daughters would live with their parents 
which they would live with their own apartment. And there will be entire families living in just a small apartment. The space and arms race were somewhat close races between the Soviets and the Americans. But, but it was only because the Soviets did it at the expense of their own citizens' lives, and the American government did not. After Khrushchev was removed and the space and arms race ended, the economy was mostly stagnant and people lived somewhat okay, but they still mostly just had their basic needs and not much else. Under Brezhnev, the economy could be, could be best described as stagnant, but relatively functional. The Soviet collapse was imminent, but was accelerated by, Gor by Gorbachev's Pristorika i Glasnost, or in English, restructuring and openness policies. The USSR disintegrated on, the, on December 26, 1991, with each republic ga gaining independence. Now, moving on to China, and this will be a shorter explanation because I don't know nearly as much about China than I know about the USSR, so excuse the fact that the section is shorter. Moving on to China, Mao and the Chinese Communist Party won the Chinese Civil War and the nationalists evacuated to the island of Taiwan. Chairman Mao and the Chinese Communist Party wanted to change China from an agrarian society to an industrial one, so they wanted to create a plan similar to Stalin's five-year plan. This was called the Great Leap Forward, in which agriculture would be collectivized and private farming and production would be banned and would be replaced by people's communes. Similar issues with this existed to Stalin's five-year plan. The ban on private farming reduced the incentive and efficiency of food production, leading to an undersupply of food. Due to China's very high population, it is essential to produce a lot of food through the most efficient means possible. The outlaw of private farming and the establishment of collective farming significantly reduced the economic output of agriculture, causing the Great Chinese Famine, the largest famine in history, in addition, the Four Pest Campaign exacerbated the problems of collective farming, disrupting the natural ecosystem, further reducing the amount of crops harvested. After the killing of the sparrows, also known as the Eliminate Sparrows Campaign, the Chinese Communist Party had to import sparrows from the USSR. The failures of the, of the Great Leap Forward led to economic regression, famine, mass purging, and general suffering. The only way China was able to improve economy to its modern day levels was to privatize certain services and embrace certain elements of capitalism, most specifically under Deng Xiaoping and Xi Jinping. For other socialist countries, they have a similar economic structure to the USSR and China, mostly inspired by the USSR, but with some differences. So for now, I will cease discussing about the policies of each individual country, mostly the USSR and China, and why socialism doesn't work. As I explained already, under socialism, the state controls all the elements of an economy, including prices, wages, production, the creation of capital goods, retail trade, and every other element in a functioning economy. There are several good arguments against a planned economy, but the main and best one used is the economic calculation problem. The economic calculation problem, or the ECP for short, is criticism of central of, ec of central economic planning developed by the Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises. Under a market economy, people's subjective values are transformed into objective information, which is the price, and the price is necessary for the rational allocation of resources within a society. Price in a market economy reflects the supply and demand for a certain good, service, or a person's labor. Since value is subjective and people desire certain things more than others, prices reflect the average value within a society. Prices are determined by a combination of various things, which include people's subjective values and personal desires, supply and demand, and the labor needed to create these products. The ECP argues that since prices are determined by individual action and values, since a market is a result of, in, of individuals acting to achieve their own self-interest, prices cannot be set by government bureaucrats. Not only does the state not have enough information to accurately set prices, but the state can never know every person's personal preferences, which are unique to every individual. The prices set under socialism, therefore, are useless. They do not represent the real value of a product. Without a proper price, resources cannot be allocated efficiently and resources cannot be produced as efficiently either. The lack of real market prices is one of the, re is one of the main reasons why socialism fails. Government officials cannot determine the value and preferences of every individual, therefore cannot set prices which reflect the market. 
The second reason for the failure of Sertia is a lack of profits and losses. There is no way to discourage wasteful or unproductive behavior. Since the state has a monopoly over the economy under socialism, it has no competition. This means that it is not threatened by another entity and does, need it, and does not need to engage in purposeful or productive behavior. It still needs to provide enough to feed its own citizens, but it cannot, nor wants, to be as efficient as a market economy. Under a capitalist economy, or a market economy, profits are the reward for creating value and using resources efficiently to make a product. And losses is meant to be a signal of waste, and that the costs exceed the revenue because of unpurposeful, unproductive behavior or simply a miscalculation done on the owner's part of a business, for example. Under socialism, profits and losses don't exist, as the state controls all resources and property within the territory it holds. The bureaucratic individuals running the economy only use it to benefit themselves, and they don't care about creating value for the consumers. A state-run economy typically has a broken or non-existent feedback loop, meaning that the state doesn't care about the demand of consumers. This is evident by the constant shortages of consumer goods under socialism. This is because the government simply can't or doesn't even want to produce enough goods to meet the demands of the consumers. The government bureaucrats and party officials of socialism have no incentive to produce enough to meet the demands of the people. Either way, they will get to keep their total monopoly. This contrasts to a free market economy in which the only way to gain profits is to create value and supply the needs of the consumers, meaning that they willingly want to purchase your product. The final reason for socialism failing is the huge government bureaucracy. Due to the fact that the economy is planned under socialism, you need people to manage and plan the means of production, which are the bureaucrats. A new class is created under socialism, the manager and planners who plan the economy and the people who manage the planners and the, manage and the managers who manage the managers, and so on. There are many bureaucrats who contribute absolutely nothing to the society, but are still, but still by the state, they, but the state still takes resources from the economy to pay them, which could have been used to generate what people actually need. To conclude this long video, these are the key reasons why socialism fails. It lacks real market prices, doesn't have profits or losses to encourage productive behavior and discourage wasteful behavior, it doesn't have an incentive to meet the demands of the consumers, and it has a huge bureaucratic class which doesn't create any value and simply takes value from the society without producing any. I mostly discussed about the USSR, since I know the structure of it the best, but every socialist country works similarly to an extent. Before I end this video, even the socialist countries are not pure socialism. They have some private institutions. For example, in the USSR, there were food markets in which people could freely exchange food for money, and the, and the, and the state allowed that. And without, for example, these food markets in the USSR, and without certain other key private institutions, the countries would simply collapse. Nobody would produce anything, there would be no incentive to produce anything, and people would simply take without producing until there's nothing left to take. The society would simply collapse and be destroyed. Next time, I will discuss socialism and America's uncertain future. Socialism is anti-American and will destroy this country if it is not stopped. Stop! Socialism!